Well, a big thank you for joining us for In The Sheds, our online podcast, which you'll be able to uh, watch throughout the summer. It is our first one back for 2022-23. My name's Michael Sheedy. I am one of the co-hosts with my fellow co-host, Andrew Walton. Fresh from a trip around Australia, Andrew, watching cricket, paying a lot of attention to cricket being going on. Welcome. Michael, thank you for having us here within the sheds and looking forward to bringing to this original content the season ahead. And we have here our two players today, feature players, Simon O'Brien, St Kilda legend, closing on 300 games and the evolutionary genius of the Rocket Factory. And we have Xavier Crone, Victorian listed player, fast bowler, gun for hire for any T20 comp in the world. <laughs> and we're going to start off with the off-season comments for a start. And we're going to go to Xavier first of all around his down experience with Southern District. So Xavier, I'll open the first question. How did you get there? Yep. And what did the season look like for you, please? Yeah, well, firstly, thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, for me, it was a case of getting to the end of last season, the Melbourne season, and thinking I'm not ready to go back indoors yet and wanting to play play more cricket and looked at my opportunities and it was either a 26-hour flight to the UK or a four-hour flight in 30-degree temperatures in Darwin. So it was a pretty easy choice in the end. And then so I just put out a bit of an expression of interest and the uh, the Southern Districts Club came back and said they'd be happy to have me. And so I went up there and yeah, had an awesome time. And the structure of the season that you're involved with looked like what, please? So we went up there and it was, for the club cricket, it was, I think, a block of one day is at the start of the year, and then into red ball cricket. But then alongside that ran uh, some competitions. There was a Cricket 365 and the Top End Strike League run by NT Cricket, and they were just fantastic uh, competitions. That I think towards the, the middle of that season, I was playing three games a week, so it was exactly what I was after. And the sort of play, in the Cricket 365 and the Strike League, the sort of players that you were competing against, but yep. also who came into your your own club structure, please. Yep, um, so the Cricket 365 competition had a combination of local players and players sent by the states. So I think of the, in that competition, there was guys like Tim Ward who opened the batting mm-hmm. for Tasmania this Shield game, Sam Fanning, Josh Kahn, um, Wes Agar, Jordy Buckingham, these guys who are playing Shield cricket now. So the standard was super high quality and it was a really good test of your skills against some of the best players in the country. Sam Kerber also was a Southern District boys and yep. uh, probably, I think you quoted him as saying, he's probably the best club cricketer at the moment in Australia. Yep. Um, Sam was a fellow Richmond um, cricketer as well down here in Melbourne. Um, has gone to Adelaide, played Shield cricket last year and Adelaide won player of the, top player of the season. Yep. Um, how good is he and um, you know what what is why did he go up there I mean you obviously spent a fair bit of time with him but yep. is it is it so that he can still just get the volume in and not have to go to England and still be close to South Australia should they want to get him back in the in the fold what was the what was the thoughts there it was a little bit of that but I think he also followed a little bit of love up there I did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so his uh, his fiance was uh, oh, had his work okay. out there as well but yeah Sam I think he was when I was going told someone I was going up there, it might have been Shane Coop, he said he could be the nicest person you'll ever meet. He is, And yes. that, was, that was an understatement. Yeah. For as good as a cricketer Sam is, yeah. and which I think he is one of the best club cricketers in the country, mm. he's an even better person. So he was a terrific teammate to have up there. And yeah, just his skill set, and even learning off him, just the mm. conversations you have, like as a spinner, mm. even like some of the stuff he's talking about, like as a quick, you can still build in on that. Yeah. And then his approach to batting as well was just super insightful and great to learn off. Yeah, today's a bit of a fast bowling theme. We all do love fast bowlers. And okay. I'm going to bring you in here, Simon. So as, as the evolutionary genius of the Rocket Factory, yeah, maybe just to start, just um, give us a bit of a background as to what the Rocket Factory is all about. and Because it's a number of years into it now. Yeah. It's not just a one-off gimmick thing. Yeah. And how your pre-season's evolved so far. And then we'll get some fast yeah. bowling chat going. Yeah, so I guess the Rocket Factory sort of started initially uh, when we were in COVID. So we were actually hard locked down and it started as a, a, a WhatsApp group with uh, Crossy, Adam Crossway, Matt Hennig and, and Will Lovell. And we're just joking, being a bit cricket nuffies because what else do you do but sit at <laughs> home and talk about cricket and when you're in lockdown. And then once we got a few freedoms is that that was our message group to go, hey, we're going to go to the Nets and work through that and it sort of evolved from there and boys putting the videos in of them bowling and then it started a bit of communication about you know what are the things we work on 
Um, and then just expanded and grew from there. And I guess where it's really helped for the pre-season is, you know, cronies up and down, 30 degrees, sun's out, Swedish backpack is everywhere. Um, <laughs> Are they that, allowed back yet? Uh, I think they're sneaking in just, <laughs> just to see crony. But, um, you know, when you've got a 9 to 11 o'clock at night session at the Junction Oval, you've got to try and figure out ways to keep blokes motivated. So, mm. one, I think, you know, the speed guns at the Junction are great because every bloke tries to kill everyone and bowl 130Ks, 140Ks yep. an hour. And then and, and another really good motivator was just getting the to the boys and getting mm. it on social media. And they were sharing it out and it, it actually worked as a, a an unconscious motivator for them. I didn't think it was going to initially and then they're like, oh, mate, can you get me on? Can you get me on? So, oh. you know, Chicken and, and Chalk, so Matt and Matt and Will Lovell were, were all over the socials and winding themselves up every week. With that, so you found that the players were prepared to use vision yeah. of themselves that you would normally use as a coach internally and put it out on, on social. So what sort of platforms were they using and were they doing any filters and stuff just to maybe accept uh, uh, rockets? No, no. I Will Lovell doesn't need a filter. He's no, a pretty, yeah. pretty good looking specimen. Yeah, Will, the problem was is we're trying to sort of attract, you know, male cricketers and there was a big female market with Will being on the social. But, um, it was predominantly um, Instagram. That was the, the sort of first one, and then we'll actually set up TikTok. So it's I guess those, those two, and I've got no idea about TikTok, so it was just purely Instagram for me. But um, I think what it did was it just got exposure to other cricketers, and yeah. you know how hard these great cricketers actually work, and and you know how good they actually are. Because there's so many park cricketers that go, oh, great cricketers, like oh, I could go and play that. I bowl 130. Yeah. And then when you've got Matt Henny bowling 135 to someone in the nets, and it looks like they're going to kill them, they yeah. go, holy crap, this yeah. is this is actually really quick. Which is a really good point because you always hear about like, oh, he bowls 130s, and it's like oh, I've actually seen you guys firsthand um, at the junction, and I mean 130s is fast, no mm. matter what any batter says, yeah. um, and obviously indoors it's even quicker, it feels it, because you're yeah. enclosed. And um, three metres over the line. And yeah, and also that, but also new, you guys weren't frightened to use new balls. Yeah. Um, with the, did the inspiration come from, like the MRF Foundation did it many, many years ago with the great Dennis Lilly when he set it up, and it was to actually find the fastest bowlers in India. Yeah. That, is that the scope now? Like, I mean, I follow it obviously religiously, and I'm loving the content, but it just seems to be, experimental around just trying to bowl as fast as we can um mm. you know dog eat dog type mentality yeah is that getting the content that you think like that you want to get out there and that people are starting to get interested in the fact that you you bowl some serious gas at these guys yeah. both indoors and outdoors yeah I look there's a level of clickbait there yeah. so so to get the interest you've got to <laughs> do something do something special do, do something <laughs> exciting but um yeah if you, if you look at coaching over the years there's a lot of people and a, and a lot of kids will see or, or hear and be told is, you know, just hit the top of off, yeah. be accurate. Like my biggest belief and the thing that I've sort of always sort of felt from, you know, when I've come through is just try and bowl fast. Yeah. Cause you can't really develop speed. If you've, you've either got it or you don't, you yeah. can increase it by you yeah. know, five, 10 Ks an hour. But those, the people with raw pace are the ones you want to grab a hold of. Yeah. You can learn, I guess, consistency over a period of time yep. through volume. But it's really, yeah, when you train purpose, hard, fast, yeah. aggressive, and then control will come. Purpose, hard, fast, aggressive, is that without delving into too much of St Kilda's, um, you know, game style or plans, but is that something that you've created yourself or is it something you've learnt from other people and put it all together? Like, um, how's that evolved? I mean, it's a great, it's a, it's a, it's a yeah. great uh, lot of words there to throw in and uh, make it your make it your plan yeah look I, I don't claim myself to be a smart person I, I just try and steal <laughs> a lot of really good ideas of a lot of different people you know I've, you know, had the luxury of you know working with Adam Warren when yep. I was first came down yep. the Saints Adrian Jones yep. um, being in and around the Vixen training with those guys and you know mm -hmm. seeing your Clint McKay's who's yep. an exceptionally smart cricketer those guys and, and pick and pull mm. the best things that you can see yep. and go oh I can use that there and you know Sakes would say oh do this and, yep. and Use other people. I think mm. that's where maybe my intelligence comes is like figuring out what actually could work. It's good coaching. Xavier, when you're in the sheds, mm -hmm. up and down in the off season, and you've gone through some of the social content and you get through the humour aspect, but yep. you're, you're the generation coming through where most of the games you play are being streamed. Yep. Access to vision is a normal mm. thing. Um, how, do you, how does that sort of fit into your own development as a player in having access to this sort of content that's yep. self-generated, but then also being able to see 
yourself and your own games and what goes on. And does and does it motivate <laughs> the guys to see what they're doing and go, well, let's do our own thing at Carlton, so to speak? A little bit. I think the footage is massive. Simon and I actually was talking yeah. about this in the car park. It's like the, to use golf as like a bit of an analogy, is like if you hit a big slice, you go and get a lesson and the coach says, I want you to hit the biggest hook you could possibly, possibly can. <laughs> and they film you and they show you and it's just the most perfect swing. Yeah. Because in your body, you feel like you're doing one thing, yeah. but it's not until you get shown the footage that you realise, yeah. hang on, like I'm not doing what I thought I was doing. Mm -hmm. Let's make some adjustments. Mm -hmm. And then that, that way, you've got that base point. And if you just keep training that over time and keep filming it, keep seeing where you're going, you can sort of track that progress and get to where you want to get to. So the footage is huge. And then also, it's not bad seeing if you can send a stump car wheeling or hit a big <laughs> <laughs> the boys are The boys are in there on the frog box, the frog they got box. the YouTube, and then it's like scrolling to three hours, 33 minutes where they can remember doing it, so. So as a, as a, as a player, T20 gun for hire, yeah. just in your, in your weekly preparation, just so you've obviously got a balance of, you, you, do, you do your skills, you do your recovery, do your rehab, do your game sense, but in that volume of time, how much would you actually spend just, you know, gathering intelligence and knowledge from access to information yep. you have. What would that roughly be in a week? Uh, well, it's different for everyone. Mm -hmm. there's, there's some players that will like to look at that stuff. Mm -hmm. They'll look at opposition, they'll look at how they get opposition out, um, wickets, runs, where they score, that sort of thing. But then there are other guys who don't like to look at that stuff. Mm -hmm. and they're more fuel players, they'll get out there and... Yourself though, what is it? Uh, for me personally, um, I haven't been a big footage user in the past, but I'm slowly creeping it more into my game as I look to more technical changes. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I like to look at uh, opposition players a little bit before I get into a, a game against them, see how they've got out in the past and if there's a potential weakness there or... Yeah, in, in the shed so far in, in Melbourne, it's been a bit of a soggy start to the season. Yes. So Simon, question about how, how have you been able to... So first of all, uh, we've missed the first two weeks, which would have been a scheduled two-day game from memory. Yep. And so this week ahead is what have we got? Is it another red ball game? Uh, or white, ball? white ball. White ball. So it's going to be a white ball? Have we missed the first two three. weeks? And three, we've missed yeah. the first three weeks. Beautiful. Yeah. That's just amongst yeah. ourselves. We're already, yeah, confused. We're already good. confused. So as a leader of the Rocket Factual in the club, how do you keep the players motivated through this to be able to really... And play? switch to white ball. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, well, our, our focus in pre-season, we, we just go to the ball. Red ball. Because yeah. they have yep. not used... Right. So if you look at a lot of our young guys, they haven't played grey cricket with a red ball. Mm. They've, they've had two years of white ball cricket. So okay. it's like... Yeah. Right. Let, let's try and realign and, and, and think about that. But at, at the end of the day, like... Crony would find at the top of a, a white ball game, a good ball is a good ball. Yep. Mm. You know, you're still trying to hit that top of the wall. Yep. Um, so in, in terms of keeping the guys ready and motivated, it's, it's switching on, switching off. Mm -hmm. you know, I think there's about 15 of our boys went to the races last week. Okay. So yeah. you know, have, having things outside of career, because if you just sit there and yeah. you know, you're, you're constantly training, there's no switch off or there's no reward or, or things like that, particularly not being able to play, it can be a pretty frustrating time. And if you just keep bashing bashing their heads against a brick wall, mm. people will become sort of disingenuous, yeah, disinterested in that, so. Yeah, excellent. We're gonna to shift to the international stuff. Yeah. And Michael, come into here, please. So mate. T20 World Cup's upon us. Um, everyone's in the country. Um, it, it is a, a little bit of a, there's um, of our lower level uh, countries who are fighting it out for the final spots in the, um, in the main um, draw, mm -hmm. part of the draw, but T20 cricket, pace is a weapon. Obviously, that's our big theory, to, our big uh, concept today in regards to which we're discussing. Where do we see it playing a role? Xavier, I'll start with you. Um, Matchups, obviously, are everything, but yep. pace is pace and uh, has the ability to nick off and, and rock and roll anyone. Where do you see it coming into the T20 game this, this tournament? Absolutely. Uh, early wickets, I think, is going to be the key. I think in the, the way T20 cricket's broken down now, Teams realise if we can get two wickets in the power play, it completely sets us up. Yep. And vice versa, the batters like if we can not lose two wickets in the power play. Yep. I think the statistics back that up that if you can get those early breakthroughs mm. and two for twenty, two for thirty off yep. the first six, mm -hmm. you're a long way ahead of the game. Okay. So and pace, like you got Mark Wood Freeman who's yep. top in one fifty. Yeah. Really excited to watch the Pakistan bowling attack because they've yeah. got some guys both right arm, left arm. Yeah who top that sort of speed and yep. there's no substitute for ball speed. Mm. I think batters can say what they want, but if a bloke's buying 150 and has yep. the ability to hit you in the head, 
you're not going to be, yeah. yeah. you're not super comfortable. So with the, uh, and talking about pace, like when we talk about the IPL, obviously the ground size, um, England, the ground size, we come to Australia, we've got big grounds, okay? Is that a factor and is it spoken about that we can afford to bowl the extra quicks and bowl a little bit quicker and be a bit more Absolutely. aggressive in the power play? Absolutely, yeah. I think you'll see a lot of, especially grounds like the MCG, the Gavis Square, yep. Optus Stadium, these big boundaries, teams will mm. look to use pace. They'll just bash the top of the stumps yep. and then use your two bumpers. Okay. So I think we'll see a lot of fields where mm -hmm. it's gone to the days of third man fine leg. That's no longer a thing, especially right. in power play. Okay. Yeah. It'll be, you'll see a lot of the two on the leg side or the, the squares either side, I reckon, okay. where, yeah. Yeah, okay. and you, cause you kind of want to make the players think, oh, third man fine leg. I might try and play that one because mm -hmm. from a bowler's point of view, you'd want to try and play an inventive shot yep. rather than just hitting a length ball out to square length for four. Yeah. So yeah, I think we'll see some interesting tactics and yep. some different fields, which I don't think we've been seen too often before. With that, then sob the variations from fast bowlers. Mm. So um, Kane Richardson, yeah, yeah a, an unbelievable um, bowler in regards to his variations, and obviously I believe plays a big role for this campaign for the T20 for the Aussies. Um, what are the variations apart from obviously like the bumper? Is crease line Yorker? Are we still, is that is that more deck like, or is it still used in order to? I mean, because a lot of batters are still clearing the front dog, Brad Hodge style, um, sort of Glenn Maxwell, Josh Butler, yeah. amazing exponent of it. Where does it? Is it still there? Like, are there how many variations are the fast bowlers using these days? Oh, oh, it really comes down to the bowler. Like, you know. We, Josh Hazelwood, very simple, hits the top of off. But it, his variations are subtle. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you look at Kane Richardson's variations, his variation is broad. Right. So it's about the level of variation. It's, Hazelwood will have probably four or five different balls. He'll cut his yep. slow balls, pace on, pace off, various pace, hit the deck harder, yep. kiss the wicket. Whereas Richardson's really around going pace up and pace down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and a lot of the thing about T20 and the way that I think about bowling and, and, and tell a lot of the boys is it, it's about being consistent without being predictable. Right. The moment you become predictable, it doesn't matter how skillful you are, yep. if, if someone sees what's coming, yep. you're going for six at, at that international level. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so with the Australian lineup, let's just touch on it. Obviously, it's out close to all our hearts. Hazelwood, uh, Stark, didn't bowl with a new ball the other night, bit of an experiment. Um, they, they gave it to Cummins. Do we expect Stark and Hazelwood to take the new ball? Is that the way that you would see it come the when it comes through the real time for, for game one? Oh, I, I just can't see how you can't bowl Stark with a new ball. No. You know, Crony was saying before, you take two wickets, yep. your ahead of the game. Left arm. Stark, Stark has the ability, probably the strongest ability in the world outside yep. of maybe Bolt with yep. the new ball to take wickets. Okay. Yep. So Stark, Hazelwood? Stark, Hazelwood, yep. Cummins, Richardson. Cum Cummins is brilliant through the middle, um, and Richardson can play any role. So he's still the Mister Fixer. Okay. Pat's also in the in the IPL. Sorry, in T Twenty money through the IPL has developed an outstanding skill to come and bowl for one over. Yeah. He does, like he's not the rhythm. Like he's got the ability to not have to be a rhythm bowler. Yeah. It's more like a yeah. 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 So with that, is there a, a case of bowling two to three overs potentially from a fast bowler's perspective? Is that at the start? Did, do fast bowlers like to get, mm. if they bowl well, do you go again for the jugular or do you oh. put them on ice and then go to your, you know, your middle patch where it sort of gets drawn out a little bit in, in IP, in T20? Oh, I think it, that comes back to consistent and unpredictability. Um, because if you go two overs, yep. batsmen probably don't get that rhythm. Where yep. if you go three, it's like, that's, got that, they've Damn. got the rhythm, they've got the read. It's like poker. You're, you're basically yep. trying to figure out what is coming next. Yep. Okay. What can we expect from the other teams with this World Cup coming to Australia that you guys have seen? You, you mentioned a couple of the quicks already. Um, Shami, for me, I saw in the, the mm. t in the in the IPL um, surprisingly faster than what I ever th would have oh, thought. Oh yeah, big, big man. Yeah, big man, faster than what I thought. The Indians still have the capacity to get the like the, the fast stuff through. Mm. Um, is that still a weapon of theirs, do you think, come this, this summer? Absolutely. I think we've seen it over the last few years, these pace attacks that India brought over to our shores have been incredible. And, and Shami's one where I know speaking to a few guys that played against him in the Test Series a couple of years ago, they were like, 
he was the hardest by far. Right. The ball came down dead straight, the seam yeah. didn't move, yeah. and it would just hit the wicket and just smash into your bat. It was yeah. a nightmare. Yeah. So yeah, sneaky fast, good skills, good Super Yorkers. Underrated. Good bumper. Good bumper. Um, Singh, who, yep. well, yep. he's, I think he's a superstar, he's, he's pretty young. Yep. Um, swings yep. the ball both ways, miles. Yeah. And, yeah, 135, 140 k's an hour. Yeah, yeah, no, he's, a, he's an absolute find. Rick's Topley, he's supposed to be, he's a bit of an unknown, isn't he, to a degree? Yeah, yeah, for England, yeah. yeah. Big raps on him. Big raps on him. Mm. Um, didn't have his greatest night, but pulled it back quite well the other night. Mm. I, it get, actually, it's a really good uh, prelude into this. The ability to go early for runs as a fast bowler and then be able to pull it back. We've seen over the last couple of games, practice matches, that's happened. Mm. Is that just the fact that the batters have got away? I mean, the other night England were 132 off 11 for one, um, and then Australia mm. pulled them back, you know, to, yeah. to a score under, to just, well, it was just over 200. Is it is it a case of that you know if you do get hit early that's okay we can still get you and just we are just going for the jugular like without crossing over too much of what we've spoken about but for the likes of Reese Topley does it matter if he goes early like gets run scored against or is he just going to be a one over one over one over man to fill a gap? Yeah, it's, I think it's a hard one. Like it it depends on your role. You know, Mark Wood the other night got belted. Yeah. Brought it back by wickets. His his role it depends on what his role is in the yeah. team. Topley probably is pretty similar because yeah. he's got great variations. He they're, they're attack weapons. Mm. Whereas you know a Pat Cummins or a Hazelwood's probably a bit more mm. defensive and strangled. Yeah. So it's about I guess understanding what what team role actually they do have to play. Yeah. Current the other night, his slower balls were as good as I've seen in probably twelve months. That's still probably I think one of England's big weapons is their their ability to change up the pace. Mm. Does that come back to so many different formats that they've played in the UK on the smaller grounds where they do have to have different tactics? Uh, yeah, I think that and also the slower wickets. Yeah. So, you know, a, a slow Over ball, there. Yeah, yeah, slow, yeah. slow ball gripping into a slow wicket, it's, gonna, it's almost like tennis ball he bounce, yep. keeps the batsman off balance. Yep. So, if we just to stay in the T20, but move into the on the field, what players go through and, and in the sheds, um, before the match, typically, so Xavier, you'll be told, yep, your role is you're going to bowl this over, this over, this over, this over. Okay. And then, Simon, you're going to work with the players and, and you would know how to structure or, or frame an over. When you're out in the middle, in the heat of the battle, um, maybe, first of all, Xavier, as, as, as the bowler, w what's going through your mind? How are you setting yourself up? And then, to Simon, how do you then control the situation if you're not the bowler, but you're part of the leadership, like who's controlling yeah. what goes on on the field? So, yeah, I think first, first and foremost, it's probably a discussion with your captain. Okay, who are we bowling to? Okay, we're bowling to Sheeds. He does this, this, and that. Let's set the according field. Mm -hmm. And to each field, it's important to probably have three balls you can bowl sort of to those fields. Okay. Okay. As Simon talked about, sort of being predictable, mm -hmm. uh, being consistent without being predictable. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, I've got this field to batsman. Look, okay, these are somewhat the balls I could expect. If it's two out of the leg, it's okay, I could get one on the on my heel, I could get one in my head, or I could get a slow one into the wicket. And then as bowlers, and I think we'll see it a lot in this, is just wide yorker or just something completely against the grain. Just throwing something out there that the batter's not expecting. Because they are now setting up, okay, these are the balls you're gonna bowl. No worries, you miss, I'm gonna bowl you. So this is a great level of, we, we like a smart fast bowler. <laughs> fast bowler, Simon, I'm speaking as a coach there. Yeah. Now let's just say, on the field, mm. it's all gone not well. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and how do you handle, how, and you're not bowling, but yeah. you've got the bowler. How, how, how do you handle that situation, yeah. please, from what we've discussed in this yeah. chance, and now we're in the moment? Yeah, look, I think a lot of it comes down to relationship. So if you've got a really good relationship, and so you know, if I was working with Crony, you know, understanding what's gonna work for him. You know, if, if you can have the greatest plan in the world, you get hit for six and you go, bang, everything's stress, mm. everything goes up here. How do you calm them back down? How do you go, right, what's gonna work for, for you? Crony might be like, right, use that adrenaline, run in, bowl fast, mm. execute your plan. Mm. Whereas someone else who's head spinning, you've just gotta get clarity for them. So you've gotta slow them down and you and you gotta have that because it's figuring out what works for individual people and, and then how they're gonna be able to best execute. Because at the end of the day, it's about execution. If you if you miss it at an international level, or even at a big bash level, you're going for six. Even mm. Premier Cricket level. Mm. But um, I know in some of the coaches I've worked with, they've talked about it's okay to get hit for six. Everyone's going to get hit for fours and sixes, but as long as it's, they're doing it off the balls you're trying to bowl, mm -hmm. and it's not just a complete 
like miss, then mm. that's okay. It's going to be okay to get hit for sixes and fours. We all get hit. Mm. But this is what can you do is the next ball, execute, worry about your plans, and get back on it. Great so, insight. Yeah, amazing Great. insight. So in the sheds, um, after the game, what's the debrief these days? I mean, you, you guys, obviously, you've got privy to a lot of amazing cricketers who are all playing either Shield Cricket, Big Bash, um, or International Cricket at St Kilda. Um, you're well and truly in that, um, already in the sheds themselves. W- what's being said after the game? Is it a case of the fast bowling cartels getting together um, and seeing how they executed? Or is it, I mean, you're, it's a travel bus that goes around the, the country pretty quickly. You're, you're on a plane or a train very quickly the next day yeah. um, if you're in England or you're on a plane or a bus if you're in, in um, Australia. So what is it spoken about? What we executed well, what we didn't, and then we just move on? That's how strictly the plans have been um, triggered? A little bit, yeah. I think um, it's going more away from like probably five, 10 years ago, those KPIs were the, all, yep. all, the, all the vogue and that sort of thing. But okay. I think people are realizing that, oh, if we said, okay, we need to take two wickets in the first power back in the first six overs. Like, well, that might not happen. We might bowl really well yeah. and not take two wickets. So that's actually quite an irrelevant yeah. statistic to measure. Yep. So it's more about the behaviours and the right. attitudes that you're taking in. Yep. So if Simon's my coach, he might be, okay, how do you think you went? Yep. And I'm like, oh, first over, I was probably just a little bit nervous, rushed in, probably didn't bowl mm. what we spoke about. Right. Got hit, came back, everything was a little bit clearer, spoke with the captain and went well from there. And I finished strong. Right. Yep. And, and he might say, yep, totally agree. I think uh, what we can work on next time is maybe for that first over, let's just maybe a couple breaths or talk to the skipper again yep. and let's just be, make sure we execute that next time. So it's a skill-based debrief in the sheds as opposed to the whiteboard KPIs, you know, Absolutely. ball by yeah. ball, session by session. Is yeah. that, and you start to see that creep into Premier level as well? Oh, look, the there's there's probably, doing? probably a combination of both. both. I think from, from a holistic team perspective, there's still the KPIs of the, the aspirationals. It's a tick cross. Aspirationals. Right. Aspirationals, yep. because... Um, yeah, you can't control when you bowl a ball or you face a ball. Yep. You can't control what the other person's doing. No. Like someone could play the greatest shot you've ever seen, or you could get a ball that rolls. Like yeah. you, you don't. You you literally lose the level of control. So yeah, I think Crony made a really good point. Is it's like against what you were trying to do. Yep. How did you go? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And and yeah. you know, big bash when you were in it last year's, you had a great opportunity to go. I'm rem- I can remediate this tomorrow or the next day because you play so many games. Whereas mm. in club land, you've got mm. a week to mm. go away and work on it. Yeah. So it'd be, it'd be quite interesting, Crony. I guess from that perspective, when you're going game here, jump on a plane, fly to Brisbane, game here, and and how that changes your mentality compared to when you're at Carlton, going, all right, I stuff these things up. I've got a whole week to work on it. Mm. Yeah. And, and I guess using that as a way of thinking of moving forward and, and changing mm-hmm. it. So, so I'm just a simple, just as a, a simple, I don't get, but as a simple metric for the younger fast bowlers coming mm. through who'll be exposed to T20 mm. cricket. In your four, if you if you bowl your four overs, yep. Um, how many dot balls are you ideally looking for? Yeah. From 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 a fast. And is it a metric 24? that is? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For bowl twenty four, I've done alright. <laughs> yes, you can bowl yeah. twenty four dot balls. <laughs> it, is, it is a metric because the other yeah. night um, Sam Curran bowled fourteen dot balls. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which. Yeah. Frederick Carson went for 13 off his four or something, didn't he? Yeah. 13 months. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I'd, I'd almost go the other way mm-hmm. in, in terms of trying to reduce boundary balls. Right. Ah, nice. Because, nice. because if you're going one a ball, Happy fantastic. Days. If yeah. you're getting hit for one in a T20, you've done your job. Right. If you're getting hit, you know, dot, dot, four, six, what's, what's better? Five singles, six singles and yeah. a dot or, you know, going for 12 off three scoring shots? So that's excellent because I like how what you're bringing there is the ability for a coach to work with a player. Mm. Again, it's just shifting the skill set into the situation of the game. As in, what can you do to put yourself in mm. that to reduce the boundary? Yeah. Um, the uh, boundary, though, is that a <coughs> thing where the boundary is beaten? So you've had slippage, is what I call it slippage, but the slippage has occurred just because it's just five metres either side of the sweeper. Yeah. Or is it slippage as in you've been hit over mid off because mid off was up? And then that's a factor where you're trying to, you go back to the bowler and you go, listen, that was really badly executed. Mm. So when you say limit boundaries, yeah. is there two factors to that? Oh, there's 30 factors. Right. <laughs> there's, Inside know, Edge, Frenchie, can't help it. Yeah. 
you don't worry about that. No. It's more about when mid offs up yeah. and it's a half volley and yeah. Butler's taking you yeah. down. Yeah, right. I think yeah, Crony sort of mentioned it as well. Is it's like if you've got a plan, you stick to it. Yep. You miss that plan, all good. Hey, you you tried. Right. Exceptional shot. Bit of a bit unlucky. Also talk about like acceptable misses. Yes. So that's a good point. for a, I know uh, as fast bowling sob will talk to us about as well. If you're bowling a bumper, yep. There's not good enough. No. Because we were talking about before, that's yeah, the baseball hit zone. That's going mm. 110 mm. metres. You'd mm. rather, you miss, in that instance, is the wide. Yeah. Because yeah. 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 it's only one run, get it on the ball, but it sort of achieves what it was there to achieve. Yep. Um, and for if you've got mid off, uh, your line becomes super important. Mm. It's more getting in towards leg stump. Because yep. as soon yeah. as you get outside the stumps, that's just golf swing territory. Yeah. Mm. And they'll be able to access that. And they're so, so good at it. Yeah. And they're so good at it. So having your acceptable miss, yeah, but your acceptable miss will be very different to mine because exactly. you're, you know, massive and I'm a midget. So there's, there's going to be different things that are going to be. Like, I'm, it's easy for me to bowl a Yorker because I'm coming from a lower base. Whereas yes. Crony will be able to get out with cutting his fingers on it, bowling bumpers, getting it up here mm. because that that plays into his skill set. Whereas different things will play into my skill set. And I think as a kid or someone coming through is. You work with a coach and understand, you know, what's going to benefit you at the moment and how are you going to get those singles mm-hmm. or dot balls rather than it just being like, oh, a bowl of bouncer here and things like that. Figure it out and, and understand what's going to work for you. Excellent. Right. So Simon and Xavier, some excellent insights there as to into the, the inner mind and the depth of what's involved with fast bowling and the three takeaways we can take from today. Consistent without being predictable, acceptable misses and individual reflections on skill execution completely different to what we would have i would have thought coming into the in the sheds session today that that's what would be spoken about because in our day it was all based on kpis and how you are you know how, how you kept the economy down and all that whereas you guys are very much based on individual matchups and individual skill acquisition so um Unbelievable insight. Thank you both so much for coming in. Andrew as a co-host, of course, but uh, Xavier Crone and Simon O'Brien, thank you very much for coming in for In The Sheds. Um, We look forward to our next episode, but most importantly, make sure we follow The Rocket Factory um, on Instagram and social media. Um, And if you are a fast bowler out there, you're bowling quick this week, make sure you get it on camera. We would love you to tag us in the Sheds underscore podcast and The Rocket Factory so that we can share it over uh, over the coming days. Crony, anything to add as we finish? Nah, not at all. I think we covered it. Thanks for having us on. No problems at all. Sob, anything there, mate? No, no. Nothing at all from me. Just bowl fast and thanks for having us, guys. Bowl fast. Thanks for coming in in the sheds. Make sure you tune in, tag us, and uh, we look forward to uh, catching up with you next week for our next episode of In the Sheds.